Hello, I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. And welcome to the 19th episode of Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, dun, 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 mm-hmm. John de la Pole, the first Earl of Lincoln. Yes, indeedy. I'm just trying to think if we've got any parochial messages. Only that we've got Patreon, but we probably... We have Patreon, and we have Patreons. So we probably mentioned that <laughs> once or twice in the last episode. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, it was a bit of a surprise. We, we weren't expecting to have it up and running till, um, well, later. <laughs> we would like to make some thank yous, which is fantastic. We have some people that found our Patreon before we even had it up and ready. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, we did. So we'd like to thank Teresa Muir, Allie Gibbs, Kirsten Trevor, Allison Scrace, Steve Cook, and someone who's taken on the noble, Andrew Schneider. <laughs> thank you very And David much. Whiteley, who we thanked before. Yes. Thank you very <laughs> much, everybody. We really appreciate it. It will help us so much with research materials and the cost of the podcast. Everything goes right back into the podcast. Yes, yes. Yeah, we won't be retiring on this. We won't be running off to Flanders. <laughs> we <won't. laughs> No. Yes, this is for, very grateful very. to everyone who's contributed. Very grateful. It does cost a lot more than we expect. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure everybody says that. Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But thank you so much. Oh, do you know what? I completely forgot to put a, together a quiz oh. for Isabel. Oh, no. I want a disaster. <laughs> it's not a disaster. I've got a bunch of stuff that, oh, man, I know that woman's life in and out. The problem is, is trying to think of things for England. Oh, I got a few. Okay. Quiz. Okay. All right. The reason I'm bringing this one up is because we had so much fun with it. How many ships did Isabella send to keep Juana safe on her way to Burgundy? Oh, it was a proper fleet. Mm -hmm. Was it something like 200? Less. Ah, 100? Close, 110. (laughs) Ah, I knew it was more than four. (laughs) Isabella wanted to ensure that there was peace between Scotland and England. What did she offer that didn't exist? Well, she offered a daughter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that is, that is a, bit, a bit cheeky, really. <laughs> yeah, it is. I've already given her to somebody else and she's already married. But he also I offered somebody else's daughter, one. didn't he? Didn't she? Because um, he yes. thought that she might have persuaded Henry to offer Margaret. Mm-hmm. Poor, poor little Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants. <laughs> oh, poor girl. Oh, man. Poor Maria and Margaret. Uh, Manuel of Portugal didn't want Maria no. either. <laughs> All these unwanted women. Yeah. Except James wanted Maria. So I guess maybe she can console herself with that. Yeah. Isabella was considered for two marriages to England herself. Yes. To whom was she considered for? She was considered for. Edward the Fourth, yes, that she was seen to write about, and the later to be Richard the Third, whom she was not all right about. Yes, <laughs> and it makes Perfect. you wonder why she wasn't. What was? What did she know? Or what did you think? Oh, uh, that was pretty much covered. So he was a younger son. He was still third in line oh, to the throne. Right. And yes, she really yes, wanted yes. to be married to a king. Yeah. So to her, she went from being a princess to most likely just being a duchess. Mm. Yeah. She was not okay with that. No, 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 no. Next one. What did Isabella do differently for Catherine and Maria in her will that was never carried out? She she said their dowry should be paid in full. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. Completely different from every other wedding (laughs) arranged in European history. Yeah, but it didn't happen, though. (laughs) No, it didn't. That poor woman, she did so much that was good. And last question, this isn't about her, but I thought it was really interesting. Who was it that fought at Loja with them? 
and lost his teeth in the battle. It was Lord. Oh, I got his ah scales. <laughs> yes, five out of five. Nice. Well, four out of five. Nicely done. Yeah, Lord Scales. Scale. I kept thinking of it as being fishy. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think spoils, spoils, because I, I know it's somewhere in there. <laughs> awesome. Well done. Uh, actually, I just read the, read it before, <laughs> beforehand, <laughs> and I still got one wrong. Well, it was very specific. I just thought it was funny because we, we were talking about fleetettes and how much is an actual fleet? Well, that was that was definitely an that's actual a fleet, fleet. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be more than four. Uh, more than four. Yeah, I think more so. More than two. <laughs> <laughs> and now, on with the show. John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Come with me, if you will, to a cathedral in Dublin. The Earl of Lincoln arrives and is introduced to a ten-year-old boy. I'm going to be the King of England, the boy says brightly. <laughs> <laughs> the Earl tussles the lad's hair. Just keep telling yourself that, Sonny, he says. Just keep telling yourself that. Oh. <laughs> well, we start off in the reign of Edward IV. <laughs> We're back there again. Mm -hmm. John de la Pole was born around 1464. And that's based on the date his parents were married, because we're not actually certain of his date okay. of birth. His father, as we know, was also called John de la Pole. And he was the Earl of Suffolk and the subject of a very early episode of Tudoriferous. I was thinking perhaps... Very pathetic. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps too <laughs> early. We might have lost a few <laughs> listeners. <laughs> his mother, as is our John's mother, was Elizabeth Plantagenet, sister to Edward IV, Rich III, and also Auntie Margaret, which will become relevant later. So he was a nephew to some big names and had a very convincing right to the throne, albeit through the female line. Not a lot is known about his early life and upbringing. He was made the Earl of Lincoln on the 13th of March, 1466 or 67. I couldn't find out why there was, why there was that ambiguity. Oh. Maybe it's just a matter of not being able to read the person's writing. He was granted £20 a year. And he was just two or three at this point. Oh, jeez. Yeah. And he was made the Knight of the Bath in 1475 alongside his cousin, the future Edward V. That's with the Prince in the Tower. And I'll call him Lincoln from now on, so we're not confused with his with his dad. He was only nine, so he wasn't quite as young as Prince Arthur when he went through the bath ceremony, but he was still quite a little chap nonetheless. It seems kind of ridiculous. You would think you'd want to make sure that... Well, I guess for everybody else, they had to prove that they were decent in order to do that, because the rest of the people that followed with them were quite a bit older than the boys. Hmm. But still, doing it that young seems presumptuous. And also, at that point, you don't actually know they're going to survive, do you, sadly? No. Lincoln was present at many of the great ceremonial occasions of King Edward's reign. But again, not much is known of his public life or his private one. Although his father was part of the invading force of France, I read that there was no mention that he took his son. But that was in 1475. I mean, did men normally take their nine-year-old sons to war with them? I mean, maybe they did. Yeah, well, Henry accompanied his ward warder uh to battle when he was 12 hmm. if you remember aren't you an adult when you're 12 was it no, 12 not yet yeah. uh it was 13 right. 12 you could well in medieval times 12 you could join the community as a pledged adult but 12 you could you'd be on you could be on a jury when you're 12 couldn't you really yes because i'm just remembering amy rob's heart coroner's jury and what one of them was 12 years old oh my goodness hmm. you don't know what you're doing when you're 12 <laughs> you no. can't make a judgment like that no also they had to inspect the body which was a 12 year old i think <sighs> yeah Ooh. anyway enough said on that i think <laughs> in 1476 lincoln attended the reburial of his grandfather the duke of york and his uncle edmund earl of rutland who had been killed at the battle of wakefield the bodies were exhumed at Pontefract and taken to Fotheringhay, where many dignities, including Lincoln's father and Margaret Beaufort, laid pools of cloth of gold <laughs> over the bodies. <laughs> I wondered if it was a bit weird, because they'd been married, hadn't they? I mean, albeit when they were very little children, but it might have been a bit odd, mightn't it? Very. Mm. 
1478, Lincoln was present at the marriage of the Duke of York to the five-year-old Anne Mowbray. And just to stress, he was he was five too. It's not one of these creepy, you know, she's five and he's much, much older. This is the Duke okay. of York that may or may not have been Perkin. But oh, we don't want to get into that again. <laughs> nope. <laughs> there was a large number of nobles present, but two days later it became clear that they were not just there to celebrate a wedding. As George, Duke of Clarence, was put on trial, he was attainted on the 8th of February and executed ten days later in a vat of Malmsey, which had (laughs) obvious implications for his son, (laughs) Edward Plantagenet. In November 1480, Lincoln bore the salt at the christening of Edward IV's youngest child, Bridget, and Margaret Beaufort (laughs) carried Bridget herself. Lincoln was married to his distant cousin, Margaret Fitzalan, at some point. And this shows, actually, that before Richard came to the throne, and particularly before Lincoln rebelled, he was not someone that people seem to have kept tabs on much. There's not a lot to say about him. He pops up at ceremonial occasions. But you don't hear much else. There's no evidence that the couple had children, although one hypothesis suggests that Richard de la Pole, Lincoln's youngest brother, was actually his son. Because being the son of a traitor is never a good thing, so perhaps this little change of identity so he became the brother of a traitor rather than the son of a traitor Mm -hmm. on the 9th of april 1483 edward the fourth died lincoln was about 20. he was probably the chief mourner since neither richard duke of gloucester nor lincoln's father suffolk were there there was a mass at the chapel which was in the process of being built in with windsor castle and afterwards there was an unseemly scuffle between lincoln's father-in-law and someone called William Barclay, over the order of precedence. So you can oh imagine them sort of sho- shoving each other out of the way. To... At a funeral. Yep, at a, fu- at a, <laughs> at a funeral of a king. But <laughs> oh well, a quick decision came down in favour of the father-in-law, so presumably Lincoln took the side of the family. <laughs> and nothing's known of Lincoln's activities during the early days of Richard's protect... protect- ah, I can't say this word. During the early days of Richard's protectorship. The Della Poles definitely supported Richard being crowned, and Lincoln and his parents participated in the ceremony. And neither Suffolk nor Lincoln challenged Richard's bastardisation of the princes, even though presumably Lincoln knew them quite well. Yeah. Because he'd undergone the ceremony of the bath with him, with uh, Edward. I wonder if Richard offered something. Yeah. On the 19th of July... King Richard left Greenwich on his grand progress, and Lincoln probably accompanied his uncle. Richard and Lincoln, although they, they would probably be acquainted, they might not have known each other very well since Richard had spent so much time up north. And this progress may have been a time for them to have a bit of uncle-nephew bonding. That seems sweet, but it's probably something disgusting, like gutting animals after <laughs> killing them on a hunt or something. <laughs> I should imagine so. Unfortunately, the progress was cut short as they heard of a rebellion in the West Country led by, of all people, Richard's good friend, the Duke of Buckingham. Yes. And it's not known what Lincoln did during the rebellion, but he was later rewarded for his good services against the rebels. He received rewards of lands worth £157, followed by the, wow. yeah, followed by the reversion of estates worth 187 in the event of Lord Thomas Stanley's death. Really? But he wasn't dead, so in the meantime, Lincoln was granted an annual income of of a similar amount. And if you're wondering why his estates were rich the thirds to dole out as he pleased, Mm -hmm. these were actually Margaret Beaufort's estates. Oh, right. She had... Whoops. (laughs) Yes. She had gone against him. She'd gone against him, and she she had to hand over her estates to her loving hubby. Mm Mm-hmm. On condition that she didn't get up to any more mischief. Mm Mm-hmm. Which she did. She did. <laughs> Lots more. <laughs> Richard's enthronement now meant that his role in the North was vacant. His son was officially filling that role, but he was just a wee bairn. And anyway, he sadly died in April 1484. And his death meant that Richard and Anne were childless. The king no longer had an heir, and the following year Anne died too. John Rouse, who wrote the Rouse Rolls for Anne that we looked at in Edward Plantagenet's episode and whose historical bias sort of flip-flopped, depending on who was on the throne. Mm -hmm. He was very pro-Richard during Richard's reign, but then when Henry came along, (laughs) he was very anti-Richard. But he wrote, Not long after the death of the prince, the Earl of Warwick, 
Edward, eldest son of George, Duke of Clarence, was proclaimed heir apparent in the royal court, and in ceremonies at table and chamber, he was served first after the king and queen. That indicates his precedence. Yeah, that he's mm-hmm. that he's been offered an airship. If that's all right. Yes, not an airship. <laughs> <laughs> he is the heir. But possibly realising that the young Earl might have a stronger claim to the throne than Richard himself, or maybe due to his youth, Richard then changed his mind. There's no evidence to say that Richard officially chose Lincoln to be his heir, and even if he did, Richard would presumably have seen him as a stopgap until he could marry again and produce another son. And possibly marry his niece, Elizabeth of York. Well, he denied all of that. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Following his son's death, Richard went to Yorkshire and stayed there until the end of July, and Lincoln was almost certainly there too. But even though though he's quite a high-up figure in Richard's court, you know, the best we can say is that he was probably there, so he's still not... Oh no, is this going to turn out to be like his father, where we don't actually have anything whatsoever, even though he did bad things? Um, he, he sort of comes into his own a bit later. Okay. Richard gave him a role in the Council of the North, so presumably this time was spent with Richard showing him the ropes, and as we'll see in a minute, Richard would have wanted things done his way. The Earl of Northumberland may have hoped that Richard's accession might have enabled him to become the King's deputy in the Northern region, but he was to be disappointed. It made sense for Richard to choose Lincoln, because Lincoln was an outsider. His family estate lay mostly in East Anglia and along the Thames Valley, so this meant that he had no conflicts of loyalty in the region and would act for the king alone. Okay. Yeah, unlike Northumberland, who had local loyalties. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It does, except this might well come back to bite Richard in the bum later on when, during the Battle of Bosworth. Yeah. When, when <laughs> yes. Northumberland just stood and watched. <laughs> but I mean, if you're trying to prevent corruption, it, it totally does make sense. It does, but people resent it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Before handing over its leadership to Lincoln... Richard set out careful regulation to ensure that the Council of the North remained impartial in its function. And this is where we see the good governance that Ricardians always talk about when they say that Mm -hmm. England missed out on a, a great king with Richard. First, the king will that no lord nor other person appointed to be of his council for favour, affection, hate, malice should speak in the council while any lord sitting on the council with any conflict of interest was to leave his seat during the time of the examination and ordering of the said matter, unless he be called, and that he obey and be ordered therein by the remnant of the said council. So, yeah, if you've got a conflict of interest, just step out to the meeting and let let everyone else get on with it, which is very sensible. Yes, it is. And it wasn't followed by Henry. (laughs) No. (laughs) No matter of great weight or substance was to be discussed or ordered unless the Earl of Lincoln was present, together with two commissioners of the peace. All letters were to be signed by Lincoln's own hand, with the words Per Concilium Regis written beneath in the presence of the council. And the council was to spend a quarter of the year at York, and oftener if the case require, where it would examine and order all bills of complaint it almost sounds like Richard is very focused on York. I know that was his seat of power when he was, when his brother was alive, but it still sounds like he's really taking care of them. Well, we'll see in a minute how how much of a micromanager he is. Oh. I mean, he was. This was his sphere, wasn't it? And he probably yeah probably finds it quite difficult to walk away and yes. start ruling London without leaving yeah. to York exactly as he wanted it. Exactly as he'd been running it before. So effectively, this was a court outside the court with Lincoln in charge, but following to the letter, the remit set out by Richard. And Lincoln was to reside permanently at Sandal Castle, as that was a residence of the Duchy of York rather than one of Richard Neville's properties, and that was to make the councillor's peer as neutral as possible. So it's all good stuff. Yes, One regulation, this is good, said that Lincoln should only draw expenses when riding to sessions or to any meeting appointed by the council. He could not draw expenses for disports or when hunting. That makes sense. (laughs) Richard used the time to rewrite regulations for the household too. 
I mean, he really is quite... Yeah, that's gone a bit far. It, is, it really is. <laughs> the, the set, a series of ordinances were drawn up by the king for the household and they ordered how the hours of God's service, diet, going to bed and rising and also the shutting of the gates were to be performed at reasonable time and hours convenient. Seriously, he's actually going down to what time to put close the gate? He's going down to where you sit for breakfast. <laughs> Oh, my gosh, that is beyond micromanaging. Yes. Oh, that would drive me nuts. It was strictly controlled, in particular, with Lincoln appointed to attend one breakfast table, member of the Council of the North at another, while the children, uh, presumably this were the daughters of Edward IV, maybe Richard's only illegitimate children, and Edward Plantagenet and his sister Margaret, who later became Margaret Pole. Okay, you just mentioned Richard's illegitimate children. Do we know if he had any? Um... I think he did. Okay. I don't know them by name. Okay. But I think he did. Okay. And there's a strict policy of no boys in the castle. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, though. Yes. <laughs> While living at Sandal, Lincoln was very much the king's servant rather than his appointed heir. The northern appointments were not the only ones to be awarded for Lincoln in 1484. On the 21st of August, he was appointed as the King's Lieutenant Chief Governor of Ireland, which okay. sounds very grand, but his role was largely symbolic as Richard Fitzgerald. No, not Richard. Why do I keep saying Richard? <laughs> Gerald Fitzgerald, the Earl of Kildare, was actually, actually run Ireland. But it, it was significant because this title was often bestowed on the heir. Right. So although he's not officially making him his heir, he's setting him up. Yeah, so he hasn't announced it, but he's giving him all those positions that a normal heir would have had. Mm. Okay. Yes. I mean, presumably he doesn't want to announce it in case he has children of his own, because then Lincoln might kick up a fuss if if he was suddenly yeah. told, no, you're not. Yeah. Mm. In May 1485, there were rumours that Henry Tudor was planning to invade, which had travelled to Nottingham in June, and Lincoln joined him in August. And Henry landed in Milford on the 7th of August. By the 22nd, he'd reached Leicestershire. Battle of Bosworth happened. Bish bash bosh. <laughs> Mostly bash. <laughs> Literally <laughs> bish bash bosh. <laughs> Richard dead. Henry victorious. Uh, we don't have to cover all that again. But we think Lincoln was there, although there's no actual documentation to say he was there, oh. apart from a letter that Henry VII sent out immediately after Bosworth. It was He sent it out to several of his nobles, which said, And moreover, the king ascertaineth you that Richard, Duke of Gloucester, lately called King Richard, was lately slain at a place called Samford, that's Bosworth, within the shire of Leicester. And there was laid open that every man might see and look upon him. Naked. <laughs> yeah, which is rude. I know, with a dagger in his buttock. Well, they, what? they probably took it out by that point, but <laughs> when, they, when, he, when they dug him up recently, yeah, they found signs of his body having been mocked, shall we say. Oh. And also, there was slain upon the same field, John, late Duke of Norfolk, John, late Earl of Lincoln, Francis, Viscount Lovell, and a few others, on whose souls God have mercy. So, as we know, neither Lincoln nor Lovell had actually been slain. No. So was this the confusion of battle, no one really knowing what had happened? Mm -hmm. Or was it expedient for Henry to claim that Lincoln and Lovell were dead so that any Yorkist looking for a leader would assume that they'd all been eliminated? Okay. So they might just as well knuckle under and get used to the new regime. But after Bosworth, we don't hear much about Lincoln for a few weeks. We're not sure whether he'd been wounded and was recuperating... Maybe he was trying to decide what to do next. Maybe he was keeping his head down until he found out Henry's plans for those who'd fought with Richard. Oh, I wonder if he went to Sanctuary, like some of the others that went fighting in Bosworth. Yeah. They went straight to churches to try to stay safe. Yeah, Lovell did, didn't he? He mm -hmm. might have done, but there's no documentation to say what he was up to. I think the Stanford brothers did as well, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Stafford. Stafford, sorry, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The de la Pole family had been on the rise until Henry beat Richard. And all this might have screeched to a halt, but Lincoln's father, as we know, accepted Henry right from the start and was reappointed to the post of Constable of Wallingford Castle. After Bosworth, the majority of Yorkist survivors recognised that their future depended on them submitting to the new regime. 
and of the thousands that fought at Bosworth, only 28 were attainted. But I suppose most of them, most of the thousands that fought there wouldn't have had anything to, to attain, would they? No, they wouldn't have had anything because mm. they would have been just the men-at-arms and people from their lands. Or mercenaries. I feel like I should apologize for my voice. <laughs> I'm still fighting the laryngitis, so it <laughs> sounds really off. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, they did it. Um, Lincoln was deprived of his offices, but he can't really have expected anything else, I suppose. Ireland went to, his un went to Uncle Jasper, and the North went to the yes. Isle of Northumberland once he'd been released from prison, so he got it in the end. And the revenues from some of his properties, Lincoln's properties, went to Reginald Bray. It must have been quite a culture shock for Lincoln because he was no longer a big cog in the machine of his Yorkist uncle. No, and he'd been that way from as a child. Mm. He'd been important since he since he was a child. Yes, I mean yes, he was attending all the all the ceremonies, but he was having yeah. to get used to the idea now that he was just a minor member of the Privy Council dealing with a king that he'd never met before. But at least he's that. He Maybe that. he should just count his blessings at have, this point. Have you ever known a Tudor to count their blessings? <laughs> <laughs> no, but really. Somebody needs to sit these people down and say, look, you are not dead. Mm. You could be dead. This is a good thing. Like, yes, you have thankful. quite a lot of money. <laughs> yes, you're not broke. <laughs> you, oh, my goodness. Yeah, selfishness runs very high. Yes, it does. Yeah, it was difficult for him because Henry brought his own advisers that had been with him in Brittany. So Lincoln was now subservient to the very men who brought about the death and destruction of his uncle. So it must have been mm. it must have been quite a strange situation to be in, I would have thought. Yeah. Well, although he can't have been that thrilled about it, at Henry's coronation, Lincoln walked with the Earl of Oxford, John de Vere, in front of Henry, possibly carrying the king's sword. So obviously they trusted him to be near the king with, that close with weapons. To the king. <laughs> <laughs> they actually didn't. Henry was surrounded by 50 people. <laughs> Probably. He usually was, wasn't he? <laughs> Who knows whether the signs of reconciliation between Lincoln and Henry were instigated by Lincoln himself or from overtures by Henry? Or was it Dad's influence? He might have said, no, give, give, give him a job. <laughs> He's a good yeah. boy, really. Yeah. I mean, Lincoln's father had been married to Henry's mother. I'm not sure that made any difference. Lincoln swore an oath to Henry, but that was probably just to avoid being attainted. And Henry liked to keep his enemies close, as we know. So the fact that they appeared mm -hmm. to have buried the hatchet tells us nothing about the motives of either man, really. No. In 1486, Henry took Lincoln on progress with him, ending up at York in April. While they were there, they heard that Lovell had escaped sanctuary and, along with the Stafford brothers, was preparing some sort of insurrection in Worcester. Well, this was soon put down, but we'll, we'll hear about that in another time. A few weeks later, Henry arrived at Worcester, where he celebrated Mass with the Duke of Bedford, Lincoln, Dorset, that's Elizabeth Woodville's elder son, and Oxford. And I only mention this, really, because in the space of a couple of weeks, Worcester has seen Lovell, Humphrey Stafford, Jasper... John de la Pole, Thomas Gray, and John de Vere. And we're doing episodes on all of them. It just, it's just nice when our people all come together, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and you can think, all of our people are in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Hmm, quite magical. Lincoln then returned to London with the king, where he was appointed a justice of Oya and Termine. Oya and Termine? Oya and Termina? I, we never figured out how no. to pronounce it. <laughs> for the City of London to inquire into treasonous activity. Henry put Lincoln in charge of the investigation of Lovell and the Stafford brothers. So was this a veiled warning to Lincoln about what happens to rebels? Or a test of his loyalty? Yes, I was wondering that. I mean, it would have been hard for Lincoln, given the close family connection with Lovell, because Lovell had been the ward of Lincoln's father once um, following the death of his former guardian, the Earl of Warwick. Most books say that Lincoln didn't seem to be under suspicion at this point. Except I saw some links between Henry putting Lincoln on the council at Sheen to look at the rebellions of the Staffords and his friend Lovell and putting Sir William Stanley in charge of the commission which condemned the writers of seditious rhymes during the Perkin uprising. <laughs> uprising, in inverted commas. 
Right. Yes. I never even thought of that. He he does tend to take people he's suspicious of and put them in charge of making other people disappear, mm. shall we say? Yeah, I didn't come across that in any any anything I read, but it just seemed there were seemed parallels there. Mm -hmm. It seems like quite a sensible thing to do if you want to test someone's loyalty. Yes. Unless he's just rubbing their noses in it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other way yes. you can look at it. In September, the Queen, the King and Margaret Beaufort <laughs> all went to Winchester to await the birth of a baby who was to become Prince Arthur. Lincoln was present at the baptism, so you know, if Henry didn't trust him, you wouldn't put him quite yeah. so close to your baby, would you? No. Lincoln was present at the council meeting of February 1487, which ordered Edward Plantagenet's removal from the Tower to be paraded around London to prove that the young boy currently fated in Ireland could not be the Earl of Warwick. See, I assumed, knowing very little about John de la Pole, that he was the instigator of all of this, but in fact he seems to have come in quite late in the, in the plot. Really? Yeah, we've already got Lambert Simnel in Ireland at this point. In my head, for some reason, he was one of the ones starting the whole thing. Mm. I, I made that assumption. Whoops. As we've discovered in Perkins' thing, when you've got rebellions like this, you're never entirely sure at what point people do join because they might be covert activity. Yeah. Yeah, but still, for what made me think that? I don't know what made me think I, that. Well, that's what I assume because you... It's one of the big names of the... Of that rebellion. The biggest name of the rebellion and... Yeah, because... Oh, I think I know what made me think that. He's, he leads that final battle. He does. Yeah, that's probably what made mm. me think that way. Cardinal Morton said that Edward spent... This was Edward Plantagenet, spent a little time at Sheen, where Lincoln talked to him daily. And I think, well, why not? I mean, they'd known each other at Sanford Castle... Uh, Sandal Castle. But the fact that Morton thought it was worth mentioning implies that he felt that it was relevant to what happened next, you know, with Edward having played his part, was taken back to the Tower, whereupon Lincoln suddenly up sticks and flees to Flanders. Uh oh, <laughs> he's made his choice. flight to Flanders. Before we look at what happens next, I think we need to look at why Lincoln, who, as we've seen, had been given positions, money, even possibly trust by Henry, suddenly packed his blags and fled to Auntie Margaret. Did you say packed his blags? <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. Suddenly packed his bags and fled to Auntie Margaret. For a start, it's not necessarily as sudden as it seemed, as we've implied before. At the beginning of the year, 1487, a man called John Main, a servant of the Abbot of Abingdon, was heading overseas with a sum of money on Lincoln's behalf, apparently. Lovell had already fled to Flanders, and they could well have been in contact. Although if they had, it seemed likely that Henry would have known about it, because he always does, doesn't he? He knew everything. Mm. So that sum of money, was he sending the sum of money to Lovell or was he sending it to Margaret? I got the impression, and obviously all these things are speculation by the people at the time as well as by us. I got the yes. impression that it was being sent ahead of Lincoln so that he would have money when he did do, oh, do a runner. OK, OK. And otherwise he'd be like Perkin and just never <laughs> have to rely on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> <laughs> and then flee from them later. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, his defection does seem to have surprised the king. But I didn't. I wasn't sure whether that meant that the king was surprised that he'd defected at all or whether he'd defected earlier than Henry had expected. Expected. Mm, and he just wrong-footed mm. Henry. But Lincoln is thought mm. to have been present at the confession of William Simmons, which is recorded in the Ooh. Proceedings of Parliament on the 17th of February. And Simmons, since you ask who, <laughs> was, was a 28-year-old priest from Oxford who admitted abducting the son of an Oxford organ maker and taking him to Ireland, where oh. he was reputed to be the Earl of Warwick. Oh. Mm. And that he had consorted, they always say consorted, it makes it sound much, much worse, doesn't it, with Francis Lovell. 
Surely Henry wouldn't have allowed Lincoln to be there if he thought there was any chance that he was not to be trusted. Unless the king yeah. well, unless the king was pointing out to Lincoln that the whole thing going on in Ireland was a hoax and not worth getting involved with. This is really convoluted. I know. <laughs> Every... Why do I get the convoluted ones? <laughs> <laughs> I get the ones where you say, well, on the one hand... <laughs> <laughs> but there's multiple people that have thought about this mm. and they all have a different opinion. <laughs> Luckily, it's not quite as bad. There's only one aspect, really, that we're not sure about with Lincoln. It's not like Perkin, where you've got about 110 of them. Yeah. But, you know, it actually makes sense that this is convoluted because it's a conspiracy. They are attempting to take down the king. So, of course, they're going to keep as much of it secret as possible. Mm. So it only makes sense. We just wish we had more of a straightforward answer. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to join the dots when half the dots are missing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but why did he, why did Lincoln abandon England? We are back to the realms of speculation. Because as far as I know, Lincoln didn't leave any explanatory letters. There are several right. possible reasons for his flight. And it's probably a combination of some or even all of them. And I guess he wouldn't be able to send anything to his father because then he'd be drawing his father into it. I think his father went straight to the king and said, nothing to do with me. Yes, he did. Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. Immediately. The king didn't even have to summon him. He just went there and said, I can't find my son. I think he's fled. <laughs> I think you would. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting at home waiting, aren't you? And that would be unbearable. I mean, it's far better to, yeah, that's true. to preempt it. But to give up your son, I don't know. Wouldn't you just leave yourself and support your own child but that's not the way he worked i suppose he had other children didn't he that yes he did mm. yes that's he did. not a situation you want to find yourself in really is it no poor dad one of henry's first acts as king was to imprison young edward plantagenet lincoln had lived this is sorry this is um I can't have, every time you say his name or refer to him now, all I hear is, I have a special friend. Yes. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, the poor guy. Yeah. This is reasons why, uh, uh, this is reasons why Lincoln might have left England. Lincoln had lived with Edward Plantagenet in Richard's household. I mean, did he put up any complaint about his friend's imprisonment? Not that we know of. Hmm. Could Parliament's decision to parade the boy around London have proved the last straw? It's, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't want to see your friend used, used as a puppet. Yes, and apparently they did talk to together at Sheen, so... Especially if he was, how they called him at the time, simple-minded. I mean, I don't know about you, but I do know a few people that are developmentally challenged, and you feel extra protective over I them? I was wondering that, whether you felt a sort of big brother... Big brother in a good way, not big brother in an Orwellian way, sort of feeling. Especially if he was in his household. Like, you'd end up with that kind of close relationship where you do want to see them safe and comfortable and happy. Mm. At least I would, but tutors seem to like misery and mayhem. <laughs> they do indeed, yes. And if they're not conducting it, they're singing about it. <laughs> yes, I know. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, maybe... This is where this is how Lincoln saw the only chance of helping Edward. That if he got to Margaret's, followed the whole Lambert Simnel thing, and then the whole business with um, raiding England, and then he could get to London yeah. and free Edward. I mean, it's quite a convoluted yeah. roundabout way of doing it. But maybe yes. he thought there's no other way. I can't just let him out of prison. I've got to yes. get rid of Henry to do it. Yes. So I mean, when we're looking at motives for any of this. As far as Lincoln's concerned, some some of the motive to seem a bit, bit un, uh, unconvincing. Whereas, but I'm trying to remember your episode. At this point, even though they took him out and paraded him, he was still in apartments. He wasn't in the prison portion of the tower. So yes, he was kept confined, but he wasn't wasn't poorly treated at that he was, point. Yet. He was still a prisoner, though, wasn't he? I suppose. But would he have known? I wish we knew. Mm. <laughs> would he have known he was a prisoner? Maybe the fact that um, Lincoln and Edward were talking together. Maybe Lincoln thought, this isn't right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the poor guy. Other reason for Lincoln fleeing England? The writer Amy Lysons says that even if Lincoln hadn't been imprisoned in the Tower himself, quote, 
the expectation of compliance made a cage for Lincoln which he was unable to endure. Unquote. Which sounds quite similar to Perkins' experience, doesn't it? I mean, he, yes. he might not have been a prisoner in chains initially. But he was still he was... a prisoner. He couldn't make his own choices no. and decisions. The third reason, the political uncertainty of 1487 may have made Lincoln feel that the time had come to exploit the situation now that Henry was vulnerable. There had been the Stafford Lovell uprising and now Lambert Simnel. Where there may not have been a way out before, the door was now open enough for Lincoln to take the risk. Mm. Another possibility, he had been at the meeting which outlined the king's strategy so he would have had some useful information to take over Ooh, to Flanders. Yeah. And that might explain why Henry was <laughs> Henry was a little miffed. Yes. Another reason, Lincoln had seen Richard III and Henry VII reach the throne in unlikely circumstances, so did he think he might be able to do likewise? Hmm. It's not as if we're looking at it has been primogeniture going back generations. It's been all up in the air recently, so... Yes. Um, another reason, Lincoln ha also had local reasons for rebelling. His family had dominated East Anglia along with the Howards prior to Bosworth. The battle had destroyed the influence of the Howards. John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, had been killed and his son Thomas had been imprisoned. So that should have been good for, the, for Lincoln's family, but Bosworth also restored the Earl of Oxford to his seat at Castle Headingham. Right. Inevitably, Henry would prefer someone who'd, be, who'd shared his exile and who'd won Bosworth for him. And who was in no doubt loyal. Yes. We know that he was one of the very few that he trusted implicitly. Yes. Rather than Lincoln, who was from a Yorkist family. Had fought against him, possibly. Yeah, had strong familial ties with both Edward IV and Richard III. Mm-hmm. Success at Stoke, would uh, the Battle of Stoke, which we'll come to in a minute, would not only have brought Lincoln closer to the throne, but it would also have removed Oxford, and East Anglia would have been the fiefdom largely of the de la Poles. So the local aspect seems to me to be quite a strong argument, because mm -hmm. it's what would have affected the family day to day. It may have been that when Lincoln saw that the insurrection was underway, he thought, <laughs> not without me, you don't, <laughs> and sort of, yeah. sort of rushed over there quickly. I mean, he wouldn't have wanted to be sitting safely at home while, uh, while some, somebody else came along and usurped the throne. He would have thought, that's mine. <laughs> if it goes yes. to anybody, it's going to me. And he would have been under suspicion. No matter how things would have turned out, mm. Henry became more and more suspicious. Maybe he anticipated how badly this was going to go and decided he might as well cast his dice. Yes, I think so. He was never going to be part of the, the elite anymore, was he? No. No, there was no way he could gain that trust, not with Henry anyway. Whatever Lincoln's motives, this was a disaster for Henry and his council. By the time Lincoln arrived at Malines, Margaret's place, Margaret was already assembling her troops. She offered Lincoln 2,000 mercenaries under the leadership of Martin Swartz. She'd already funded a great navy. I don't know how many ships, but it was, it was great, so it must be more than four. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> so you know, this was this wasn't some fly by night operation to put an organ maker's son on the throne. It really was a serious attempt by Margaret to oust Henry. Margaret was two years younger than her sister Elizabeth, that's Lincoln's mother. But those two years had made all the difference to the family because Elizabeth had to make do with marrying the impoverished John de la Pole. Right. But then their brother became Edward the Fourth, and Margaret's prospects suddenly looked a lot brighter. Yes. So she got to be Duchess of Burgundy. Ooh. Yeah. I wonder if her sister would be miffed. She's the oldest. She was supposed to get the best marriage possible, and she didn't I, by a long shot. She might have loved him dearly. Possibly. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Lincoln may have attended the London festivities for Margaret's marriage to Charles the Bold, and he may have come across her when she returned to England in June 1480. But either way, Lincoln would not have seen his aunt for at least seven years. But that was OK, because as we know, Auntie Margaret is pretty good at recognising, without a shadow of a doubt, <laughs> men that she's only seen briefly when they were considerably younger. Oh, my yeah. goodness. But actually, there is no shadow of a doubt with this one. I mean, he is who he said he was. Yeah. Lincoln was reunited with his friend Francis Lovell. 
and the pair, supported by the Duchess and Maximilian, began planning the invasion of England in the name of King Edward VI. That is Lambert Simnel. Although it would appear that now Lincoln had turned up, he was seen as the leader of the movement. Either he intended to harness his cause to that of the rebels and use their dissent to overthrow Henry, or he planned to mount a counterclaim to prevent them from stealing his thunder. This was in February, and by March the 19th, Henry had issued an attainder, so there was no going back for Lincoln. Right. He had burnt his bridges by this point. Other exiles from England arrived, including Sir Richard Halston, which is a name I remembered from Perkins' episode, so I looked him up. He was attainted for his support of Lincoln, then pardoned, but then he was straight back across the waters to Flanders again to support Perkin. It makes you think, did he honestly believe that both Simnel and Perkin were who they said they were? And they came from two different directions. Mm. I don't know. I don't know how anybody could believe who was who. Either that or he hated Henry so much he was willing to grasp at any anybody. straws. Yeah. Anybody would have been better. Yeah. It's thought that Lincoln and Simnel met in Ireland on the 5th of May. But we'll have to wait for Simnel's episode to see what he'd been up to in the meantime. And this is the point where Simnel was carried on the shoulders of the tallest man, as is shown in the depiction of him that you usually see. And in the picture, he looks about five, but he was actually ten. Okay. Because mm, we were speculating he was a bit older, but he was, you know, he was ten. And that's probably why Henry thought, didn't see him as a threat. And Yeah, the, he's way too young. Yeah. The rumour that the boy in Ireland was the real Edward Plantagenet, having been switched by George, Duke of Clarence, was doing the rounds. And it, it would have to, really, because that's the only explanation for any of this, isn't it? Yes. When back in the 1450s, Henry VI had sent Richard of York to be Lieutenant of Ireland to get him away from court and to put a stop to any challenge by Richard for the crown, Henry VI couldn't really have foreseen that his attempt to free himself from an opponent would make Ireland such a centre for Yorkist sedition. <laughs> <laughs> Short-term measure that backfired big time. Very much so. 24th of May, Simnel was crowned Edward VI, sanctified by two archbishops and 12 bishops. Wow. Yeah, so they, said they were doubling down. Well, we see now why Henry was so keen to send out a doctor of divinity to Ireland when he heard about Perkin. Yes. He needed to make sure there'd be no more of this crowning malarkey. Yeah. An Italian, Signor Ottoviano, later recalled how he had personally incurred the wrath of Lincoln for refusing to participate in the coronation, to the point where he feared for his life. And that's the only point that I found where we see someone interacting directly with Lincoln, so we get some idea of his personality. Oh. And he sounds horrible. Well, but do we really? I mean, you're you're going against a conspiracy, and in other cases you would have been killed so that you wouldn't talk. So is that is that really Lincoln's personality or is it just the situation? I think this man had just said I don't want to come to the I don't want to come to the coronation. I don't think he was necessarily saying so I'm going to rise up against you or anything. I think he was just a vis visiting Italian who didn't want to go to the coronation. But in a lot of those situations though you're either with us or you're against us. They don't give you a middle ground. No, they don't. No. Hmm. I was about to say there's no middle ground in the Tudor times anyway, but his dad found one, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were surprised that anyone could have suggested that Lambert, Lambert Simnel could have been seen as a dummy run for Perkin. But you could look at it from the other direction. If Charles VIII of France was looking around for something to distract Henry away from Charles's invasion of Brittany, he may have looked at, at the Simnel conspiracy and thought that boy claiming to be Edward Plantagenet certainly spooked Henry could, mm -hmm. could I do that and again? And was a second boy, yeah. Yeah. So hmm. so if we look at it from that way, it's sort of a dummy run for Perkin. If if Charles thought, great, that worked, that worked brilliantly. <laughs> Let's yeah. do that again. Okay, right, this is the tricky bit. What was Lincoln's opinion of Simnel? He must have known he was a fake. He knew the real Edward Plantagenet was in the tower. Right. And he knew him well. Right. Unless uh, Lincoln was faking it, he'd have known that the lad in the tower was Edward. Yes. I mean, even if he'd heard the rumours that the Duke of Clarence had swapped him, Lincoln had lived with Edward in Sandal Castle. All right, they hadn't sat on the same breakfast table, but they'd have met at other times. Yeah. 
there would have at least been interaction. Mm. And what was he thinking as he watched Simnel being crowned? You know, was he thinking it should have been me, or was he already harbouring secret intentions of his own? I mean, was Simnel just a way for him to get in? Or was anything better than Henry? I don't know. He's, he's the son of an organ maker. I mean, as a noble, yeah. as a no, as an he earl, he could have had an accident. I think he was. I think he may well have had an accident. Most historians believe that Lincoln planned to take the throne himself. Only one th- thought he was actually deceived by Simnel, and that was Bernard Andre, Henry the Seventh's court historian. And we have a special episode about that gentleman planned, so we can decide what we think then. But mm-hmm. having read Bernard Andre's history. I wouldn't believe a word he says. <laughs> Not a word. Is it even remotely possible that Lincoln would have defected to Flanders knowing that he'd be attainted, and so might the rest of his family? He wasn't to know that his father wouldn't be. Just to put Lambert Simnel on the throne. Yeah. Even if he expected to be the power behind the throne, would that be enough for someone who knew that his claim was second only to Edward Plantagenet? And was greater than Henry's, or at least as good as Henry's. Well, most people didn't think Henry had a claim at all. No. So it would have been mm. better than Henry's. Anything would have been better than Henry's. Yeah. Francis Bacon, writing a century later, said that Lincoln had used Simnel in the hope that he, quote, might open and pave a fair and prepared way to his own title. That if all oh. things succeeded well, he, Simnel, would be outdone and the true Plantagenet received wherein, nevertheless, the Earl of Lincoln had his particular hopes. And I'm not quite sure what outdone means in this context, but I think we can imagine. I think so, too. He could disappear like the other two boys. Indeed. The Orchists, with an army of mercenaries led by Martin Schwartz, left the Netherlands at the end of April and joined Simnel and the Irish lords in Dublin. Several Yorkists were already in Ireland, including Sir Henry Bodrugan, I don't recognise that name. Did we talk about him before? We have. We last met him half-heartedly besieging John de la Vere at St Michael's Mount. Oh, he was right. He was the one who kept letting them out to get food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we couldn't work out why. Why was why was he letting them out? Well, John de Vere was a pirate. But Rugen was meant to be arresting him, not letting him settle, settle down comfortably in the St Michael's Mount. But it turns out... But Drugan was a pirate too. Oh. <laughs> hmm. When Henry came to the throne, he sent people to arrest Badrugan, and they chased him to the edge of a cliff. And he jumped off the cliff, swam for his ships, and sailed for Ireland. And the, the place where he jumped off is called Badrugan's Leap to this day. And I, really? I tried to find it on Google Maps, but it wasn't on there. But yeah. That's cool. So that's why he's in Ireland. He just he jumped off a cliff. <laughs> Well, we looked at why Lincoln joined the rebellion, but why did other people join? I mean, the old Yorkist versus Lancastrian rivalry doesn't seem to go far enough when you're following somebody like Lambert Simnel. Yeah. I mean, it's partly to bring back a leader who was more likely to return them to everything they had before. Which makes sense. Yeah, but almost more importantly, human nature being what it was, what it is, was to remove personal enemies who were enjoying Henry's favour more than they were. Because it must have been galling to watch other people having what you used to have. Probably a mixture of yeah. the two. I want I want to be at the top, and I don't want you to be at the top. Yes. That, 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 seemed, that seemed very real to me, that idea. Yeah. Henry now braced himself for the onslaught. He was unsure from which direction the invasion would come, or even who would be challenging his throne. Would it be King Edward? landing on the west coast from Ireland, or Lincoln invading East Anglia. Henry decided it would probably be the latter, and commissions of array were issued at the beginning of April for the counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Cambridgeshire and Huntingdon. And commissions of array are? That's all on the east coast. um, Commissions of array are telling local lords to start gathering troops. Ah. Well, this was a pity, since the, the army didn't land on the east coast, they landed on the west coast on the Lancastrian coast, and they began marching towards York, and the army consisted of 2,000 mercenaries and 4,500 Irish troops, along with Lovell, Lincoln and little old Simnel. But as so often happens, and as we've seen with Perkin, the anticipated rush of the local population to join the army as it marched across Yorkshire never happened. 
And when, when they reached Middleham, which was Richard III's castle, Lincoln and Lovell must have thought they would get backing because of Richard's links with the area. Right. A few people joined, but not the large numbers that they needed and that they expected. You think, well, why not? Why did people not join? But then imagine that you live in Yorkshire, They're lucky enough to live in Yorkshire, lovely place. You probably didn't have any particularly strong opinions on who was on the throne anyway. Because they're so far away? Yeah, I'd have thought so. Okay. I mean, what would it, what would it have to do with you anyway? A motley gang of ill-clad and unarmed Irishmen, along with German and Swiss mercenaries, whose uniforms probably made them look very un-English, turn up in your village, and they're shouting that they're going to put a 10-year-old boy on the throne that you've never even heard of, <laughs> and that they're going to kill the king. Do you give up your home and family and livelihood and march off with them? No, and the, the king at this point hadn't done anything bad for York. York was doing just fine. Well, as we'll see in a minute, York was quite happy with the king. Or well, whether yeah. they were happy or not, they were certainly knuckling down. I mean, these people looked like an invading army. Although Lovell and Lincoln had links to Yorkshire via Richard III, their hereditary lands were in the south. So as they marched through Yorkshire, they couldn't call upon feudal fidelity of those around them, like they could have done if they were marching through Oxfordshire or East Anglia. They, were, they yeah. were a long way from home. One of the other reasons people didn't join is that they would have been taking a risk supporting the rebellion. They might not have known it, but the Pope had just reissued the papal bull confirming Henry's title. And excommunicating those who rebelled against him. Yes, which right. is really something, something to consider, isn't it? Not just for your lifetime, yeah. Lincoln and the mercenary leader Martin Schwartz fell out. Schwartz felt that he'd been deceived about how much support their army would be able to muster now they were on English soil. I think Lincoln had obviously said, just like Perkins said, don't worry, as soon as we get there, they'll all come flocking. But they don't. Yeah. But it was too late. They were all committed. They couldn't just turn around and go home. On June the 8th, a letter written by the king, i.e. Simnel, was asking for board and lodging in the city of York, and he promised to pay his way. The letter was almost certainly written by Lincoln. And Henry had written similar letters before his invasion, but his had met with a certain amount of success. And Lincoln presumably expected this letter to do likewise. But he was disappointed. Three chamberlains from York were sent to meet with Lincoln and Lovell. Not with Simnel, you notice. And that, that's a, that seems to be a running thing. That, But he's a child. He's a Would child. they have expected him to say anything mm. worthwhile? No, no, not really. And they, they were informed that York would resist any attempts by the rebels to enter the city. So that must have been a crushing blow for them, because they must have assumed yeah. that York would side with them, because that... Yeah, if anywhere would. That was Lincoln's area of authority. Yes. What well, it had been. Lord Clifford, not the Clifford who may or may not have been a spy for Henry that we met in the Perkin episode, offered his assistance to York and he marched out of the city but was ambushed by rebels and ended up running back to the safety of the city walls. Lincoln must have been bolstered by this because this is their first military encounter and they've won. <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially if... Martin Schwartz is beginning to have second thoughts to be able to say, look, yes. look, we've done it. Yeah, see, no problems. Not sure why you're worried. The rebel army carried on marching south. After the city of York had failed them, Lincoln and Lovell started a campaign of misinformation and they sent agents across England to tell the royalist troops that Henry himself had fled and it was thought that Henry had amassed a small fortune on the coast and then he had uh, gathered his family and rushed across the, the channel in a panic. But it's not known how many people actually believed this. But some of them must have seen it as a way of getting out of the fighting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think I'd have jumped at that chance. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> Despite the lack of numbers, Lincoln was determined to go on. Sorry. Not that he really had any choice, did he, at this point? No. There's no, there's no turning back at this point. No. There's, I mean, what would Auntie Margaret have said for one thing? She, yeah. She'd poured a large amount of money into this venture. Yeah. In fact, it, it's quite extraordinary that she was willing to do it all over again with Perkin. But I suppose she hoped to get back everything that was still owing to her. And more. From her dowry through Simnel. Yeah. And once that failed, she still wanted her dowry and she still wanted the money back that she'd poured into Simnel's fiasco. <laughs> <laughs> if indeed it is a fiasco, we'll find out. It's a fiasco. 
<laughs> Did Maximilian fund any of this? I don't know about the funding. He backed it, but I don't know whether it's financial backing or just moral backing. OK. Lincoln must have been hoping for a replay of Bosworth, where Henry won despite the discrepancy in numbers. And he must have prayed for the defections and half-heartedness that had plagued Richard at Bosworth. The actions of the Earl of Northumberland were indicating that he was hedging his bets. He's quite good at this, isn't he? He rode out mm -hmm. to confront the rebel army, um, Lincoln's army, but quickly rode back to York when he heard that a small contingency was attacking one of the gates of York. Well, this may have been a sensible move, or it may have been a way for Northumberland to avoid joining the king's army so that whoever won, he could show himself to be on their side. So if it, right. if it was Henry, he could say he was protecting York. But if it was Lincoln, he could say he wasn't on the, uh, in the battle on the side of the king. Right. I should imagine Lincoln was hoping for more, more characters like this. <laughs> <laughs> Henry didn't wait for them to come to him. Edward Hall, the historian, said that Henry, quote, knew every hour what the Earl did. That's our Henry, isn't it? Obviously, everyone knew that this was Lincoln's battle and not Simnel's. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not going to expect a child to be running anything. No, but you'd think that um, Hall would have said he knew every hour what the king did or the, the pretender. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. The Battle of Stoke. If we believe Andre, which we don't, <laughs> Henry delivered a lengthy speech to the troops in which he tells them, the Earl of Lincoln... A treacherous man, as you know, is taking up an unjust cause against me, completely unprovoked. So again, it's, it's not Simnel, it's the Earl. Mm -hmm. There are, as there always are, several estimates of the size of the armies. The most likely is that Henry had 15,000 men. That's the amount the York scribe wrote, and he, presumably he got it from the servant of the master recorder who rode to York immediately after the battle. Lincoln and Lovell had 8,000, according to an Act of Parliament later, and apparently 4,000 of the Irish soldiers died, which means only 500 were left. Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. That, that's not a battle. That's a massacre. Mm. Well, it's as we saw, as we've heard before, um, I think I've got the quote here. Yes, Molinet, the chronicler, said that the Irish were filled with arrows like hedgehogs, which is... Oh. Who is the saint that his portrait is like that? Sebastian. Sebastian? Mm. Yeah. Okay. But he was tied to a tree, I think. <laughs> they, yeah. They could barely miss. Yeah. <laughs> Lincoln had very little experience of battle. It's not known for certain whether he was at Bosworth, although it seems to me likely he would have been. But he must have relied a lot on Martin Schwartz and his mercenaries, and they were using handguns, which we haven't heard much of before. Really? I found some drawings of handguns, which I'll put on Facebook, because you'd have to have quite large hands for these handguns. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're more like blunderbusses, I think. Yeah, well, they hadn't mastered steel yet, no. so they would have been large, almost cast iron. I like the way they were called like, handguns, ooh. though, because you definitely need both hands to, <laughs> to use them. <laughs> but they were facing the Earl of Oxford and a group of professional well-equipped men-at-arms. They didn't really stand a chance, I don't think. The rebels decided to throw their full force against Oxford's vanguard because the rest of Henry's army was still deploying. So Schwartz may have thought that this was their best chance. Wipe out Oxford's forces of 6,000 men with Schwartz's superior force of 8,000 rather than waiting until Henry had got his full 15,000 and then being hopelessly outnumbered. Right, try to take them out before their full force. As we've heard, the Irish suffered very heavy losses, as they always do. Schwartz and Lincoln were both killed. Kildare and Lovell escaped, and Simnel was arrested. Molinet said that the surviving English and Irish troops were executed, but Henry allowed the mercenaries to go home. Which is fair enough, I mean, it's not really their, not really their argument, is it? <laughs> it's not their fight. The English and the Irish were Henry's subjects, and so had committed treason, much as Henry had at Bosworth. There's no definite estimate as to how many royalist troops were killed. The suggested numbers seem small enough to imply that the prerogative of the victors is deliberately to underestimate their losses. Mm -hmm. You know, you get these ridiculous things, well, <laughs> tens of thousands of them and only about 16 of us. But, yeah. uh, but it said that no one of consequence seems to have been killed or oh, injured. Ouch. I know. 
yeah, they didn't matter. No, I've I've never been able to understand how people are willing to die for something like that. No. No. Like, I can see when you're fighting against some some sort of cause, as in, if I don't do it, my family's in danger. But this is... Like, for the Irish, there is absolutely no benefit. Mm. Really. Like, yeah, maybe the noblemen are going to get more money. Yeah. But that's not going to trickle down to the masses that are doing the major hand-to-hand battles. And they didn't even give them proper armor. No. Or, indeed, any armor. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Sometimes, though, it's braver to say no than go with it, isn't it? To be the one that says, I'm not doing that. Or maybe they found a way, like, if you don't fight, I will kick your family off the land that you're renting from me and you will starve to death, including all of your family. Maybe that's... Yeah. Or if you don't fight, I will definitely kill you. If you do fight, you, know, you never know. You might be one of the 500 that oh, that walked God. away. Well, that's what they did in the First World War, isn't it? So, Yep. It's all pretty grim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I always assumed that Jasper Tudor was there. Wasn't he? But the historian Nathan Armin points out that Jasper, quote, is often reported to have been present, as he was at Bosworth, but the Duke of Bedford is noticeably conspicuous by his lack of mention in the Herald's report. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got his army in a completely different battle. I could have sworn they said we were to be here. Did we turn left when we should have turned right? <laughs> I'll go to Wales and get some troops. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Oh, oh, good old Jasper. Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was a very brave man. The battle lasted longer and claimed more lives than Bosworth. Really? I mean, the main difference was that Henry gave priority for his own safety, which his oh. more impetuous rivals lost their lives or were forced to flee. Right. Some people think it's a bit cowardly for him to hide behind his bodyguards, but you're the king... These, you're what they're all fighting for. Don't yeah. don't be daft and put yourself in the firing line. But had Lincoln won, the name of Tudor would be footnote in history. Mm-hmm. Come and gone. Lincoln's body was buried in an unmarked grave on the battlefield. He's probably the only person to die in battle twice, really, isn't he? Because apparently he died at Bosworth and then he died again <laughs> at Stoke. <laughs> The aftermath. The November Parliament dealt with the fallout from the rebellion with special emphasis on Lincoln. The Act said that Lincoln had, quote, traitorously departed to the parties beyond the sea. He had conspired at length with false traitors and enemies to our said sovereign liege lord. Despite the firebrand wording of the Act, Henry was remarkably lenient towards the Irish lords. But the lack of success in the Simnel affair goes some way to explain why they were so reluctant to get involved in the Perkin revolt later on. Yeah. You've been you've been forgiven. Don't push your luck. Yeah. And you if you've taken that many people away, you are already lost a lot of your workforce. Mm, it's only I'm trying to work it out now. It's only a few years till Perkin pops up. Yeah. The memory will still be there. Yeah. And also you've seen how it can all go horribly wrong. Yes. Lincoln's attainder accused him that despite, quotes, the great and sovereign kindness that our sovereign liege continually showed the late Earl, that he went overseas and there contrived the destruction of the king, 
and an invasion of the country. Unquote. And again, as we saw in Perkins' episode, this sounds suspiciously similar to what Henry did. The only difference yeah. being that Henry won. Henry won. That is the only difference. It's almost like he did create that blueprint. Yeah. And now everybody else is thinking, well, he did it. Yeah. But Henry got very lucky, I think, didn't he? I mean, the distinction is that Lincoln, along with many others, crowned somebody else while the king was still alive and ruling. And the only other examples I could think of, the king had already been overthrown by the time the new king was crowned. I was thinking about Richard II and right. Henry VI. I can't think of anybody else that was still actually busy ruling when, when somebody else was crowned. I can't either. Hmm. Well, perhaps somebody else will think of one, but yeah, I couldn't think of any. The attainder specifically states, quote, This act of attainder made in this present parliament against John, late Earl of Lincoln, extend not nor be prejudicial against John, Duke of Suffolk, during his lifetime. So that's OK. <laughs> so Lincoln's dedication was to his lineage and what he perceived as his rights to his lineage. His dad, Suffolk, was for the survival of the family. And he was prepared to sacrifice any rights they may have had to the succession, to his children's safety, which seems fair enough to me. Mm -hmm. As Nathan Armin points out, the only noticeable figures to have openly turned on Henry in the first 15 years of his reign were Lincoln, Lord Audley, who sided with the Cornish rebels, and Sir William Stanley. Given that Henry is famous for emasculating the nobles, this either shows that they didn't bear any grudges which is unlikely, We've, we, know, we don't know any Tudors that don't pay grudges, or that he was yeah. very successful at emasculating the nobles. Yeah. As far as I could tell, the title Earl of Lincoln lay dormant until 1525 when it was given to Henry Brandon, son of Charles, Duke of Suffolk, and Mary, Henry VIII's sister. One of the attainted properties of Lincoln was Fifield in Oxfordshire, and this was granted by Henry VII to a certain Lady Catherine Gordon, and in fact, she Ooh. was buried there. In other words, Mrs. Perkin Warbeck. Yes. So it's nice how these things come round. Yeah. <laughs> I still feel really sorry for her. I mean, you have no choice in who you marry. No. You get married to somebody who turns out to be, or most likely, is not who they said they were. Yeah. I feel more sorry for him. For, for Perkin Warbeck? Yes. <laughs> I feel more sorry for her. Well, she's buried with her head, and there's not many can claim that. Yes, but she could have lived out the rest of her life in poverty and starved to death. She could have done. She, got, she went on to marry three more times. So... Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> and then, I wonder, did she get to choose those husbands, or were they chosen for her? I can't remember. I've got a feeling there was one, at least one love match. But I might, I might be muddling her up with somebody else now. We've done so many people that they are kind of <laughs> melding yeah. together. Anyway, shall we rate him? Okay. We're at that stage. And fibbly. Intrigue. Mm -hmm. Right, much depends on whether you believe that Lincoln joined in the conspiracy later on or whether you believe that, that he was part of it right from the beginning. Okay. It's thought possible that Lovell and Artie Margaret were covertly funding Simnel's training in Oxfordshire. Lovell had Oxfordshire connections with his property at Minster Lovell, and so did Lincoln in that he had estates in the Thames Valley. So it's been suggested that he may have been funding Simnel too. But that's mainly based on geography. I, I couldn't see any, any greater argument than that. But okay. I mean, obviously, if he was in the intrigue at that point... He's still very close to Henry. Yeah. Doesn't mean he isn't part of it, because we've come across that before, that people were close to Henry and supporting Perkin. Yes. The plot may have been seen by the sort of uber amphibolizer, Abbot Sant. Sant or Sante? I'm not sure. Sante. I'm more tempted by the theory that he was plotting before he left for Flanders. He would have to have. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had an idea to leave for Flanders. Well, he'd already found out that Lambert Simnel was up and up and running because that was the whole Ooh, reason for, okay. for shoving poor Edward out, and making him march around London. Right. Abbot Sante was sending money, which was apparently for Lincoln, and I don't believe he'd have cut all ties with Lovell. Although we might find out more in Lovell's and Abbot Sante's episode. But personally, I would go for the idea that he was in it pretty much from the start. 
or that having heard about it, he was conspiring from home before he set off. Either way, it's it's intrigue. Either mm. way, that is amphiboly. You're going against the king. Yeah, I don't believe that he was for the king, or at least accepting the king, right up until the point he suddenly thought, you know, I'm I'm going. <laughs> and then he suddenly changed completely. I don't. That's not how. That's not how people work, is it? No. I mean, they do eventually hit their point, but. You usually, once you've hit that point, then you start doing the plotting before you just up and leave. You'd have to have a plan, especially since you said he was sending money forward first. Mm. That makes me think that, yeah, he was involved. Yeah, I'm pretty, I, I think so. While being close to Henry. And that is, that is intrigue. I want to give him a 10, because he... He went from being part of the Privy Council to going completely against him in battle. That is the ultimate intrigue against your your king. Yes. Yes, because Henry didn't have to give him the job on the Privy Council. He could have just said, well, you're on the other side. Yeah, so he had to have found a way to make Henry trust him enough to do that. And he was trying to kill the king. Yeah. He was intending to commit regicide. It just didn't work. Yeah, I think you're right. A 10. Yeah. Let's go with that. Is that our first 10 for Amphiboly? No, we've had... Edmund Dudley was the other one. Right. And Pope Alexander. And Emson. <laughs> we've actually given 10s to four people now. Mm. Antiperistasis. Rise and fall. Because Suffolk accepted the situation, Bosworth was not the disaster for the family it might have been. However, it did knock them back on a local level. And I think that has to be taken into consideration. Since at this time, I mean, it's less so in Henry VIII's time when it became more court-based, but at this time, families relied on their local fiefdoms for their prestige. Right. And they had lost it to the De Veres. Mm-hmm. Lincoln was still in the Privy Council. He wasn't a nobody. Yeah. Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't end up with nothing, ever. I mean, even when he was ready to battle, you had said he had put money forward. So he wasn't even going to, I now have to live off of other people. He never hmm. did that. No, I think he's he's got his, probably got his dad to thank for the fact that he, he's not getting so many Stay. points in, in antiperistasis. Yeah, but it's, it's low. Yeah. It's really low. Hmm. Well, except that in Richard's reign, he was top dog. In Henry's yes. reign, he's, a, he's quite a little dog. So I think that as far as prestige goes, locally, he's lost it. And nationally, he's gone right down, really, hasn't he? I mean, not to, not to peasant status, but definitely... No, he didn't lose his title. No. It doesn't sound like he lost his income. The only thing he lost was prestige. He was attainted once he'd left... Yes. He lost, all, he lost everything then. But how long was that? I don't know, but the fact that it's possible that his son was then passed off as his brother because it was too toxic to be John's son. But um, right. that's just a theory I read in, in the Ricardian. I'm not sure. Hmm. This one's difficult. There, yes. Well, once you, get into, once you get into conspiracies, they are so difficult. Yeah, well... I'm considering the fact that, yes, he was attainted, but then when he moved over to the rebels, he ended up being... Ultimately, the leader of their military campaign. True. So he still retained power, just not in the same spot. Mm. That's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. Yes, he might have gone down back in England, but he was up again. I mean, you could say he's, he's anti-peristasis. He's quite good because he's up and down quite, yeah. quite quickly as well. I mean, it's quite a, quite a roller coaster. Mm. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, I think if we look at it that way, he maintained his prestige and power, just shifted it from one side to another, mm. which might be more difficult than going up and down. And then I'll give him a six, which is higher than half, mm. but there's just too many questions for me to be able to give him anything higher. Yeah. Yeah. I might go for a seven because I think that on a local level, I remember reading in the John Devere episode research that people had thought that it was the return of Devere that had pushed Lincoln across the water effectively because okay. 
he suddenly realised, I'm not going to be leader around here. And, and right. accounted for a lot, the local aspect. So I'll give him seven. Okay. I'm going to stick with my six, okay. so that's 13. Martyrdom. Ten. He died. He died. He died for a cause. <laughs> Whether it's to put him on the throne or to put Lambert Simnel on the throne, it was a cause, and he died for it. So that's all we are. Yep. That's all we ask for in martyrdom, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it you is. have a cause. So you're going for a ten as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll go for a ten. <laughs> it's a twenty for martyrdom. Beijing. Well, I tried to find out if there was a pub named after him. But all I got was a list of pubs in Lincoln, which is not quite what I was looking for. There is one called the Lincoln Arms, but I don't know if it was that Lincoln. Oh, OK. Um, it was due to him that the last Battle of the War of the Roses took place. OK. I mean, if you know anything about this period of history, you'll, you'll have heard of him. Yes. But if you don't, you probably won't. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's huge. No, he didn't leave anything behind. No, he didn't even leave his title behind in as much as there was a little gap of, of okay. about 30 years or so. Oh, wow. It wasn't automatically just transferred to somebody else then? As far as I know, it went straight to Charles uh, Charles Brandon's son. Okay. I mean, quite, hmm. quite often you get these sort of hiatuses with titles, don't you? Yeah, I don't think it's... It's big. Actually, I was—I must admit—I was expecting more from him. I mean, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> when, when I did, um, when I was working out the uh, "Come with me, if you will," I just sort of scrolled up and down my notes, thinking, <sighs> "Where am I going to? Where am I going to get it from?" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm thinking really low, because unless you specifically know about this time period, you wouldn't know who he was. No, I don't think you would. And he didn't leave anything. He left a lot of grieving Irish families, I suppose. Yes. I think wow. the fact that he, he was res responsible for the last, well, amongst other people, was for the last the War of the Roses counts for a bit. Mm -hmm. But that was, all, that was all I could dredge up, really. A two? Oh, you're really... Uh, I was going to go for a four. I'm not, uh, because we are going to do some people that... Really, are not complete unknowns. Yeah, yeah. I like your four mm. for that. Yeah. Okay. Flaunt a bleeding flaunt. I sent you a couple of pictures because you always share your screen, don't you? But I always send you the pictures because once I got the computer going, I don't want to touch it in case anything goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got quite the beard, hey? <laughs> this was on an online encyclopedia. Okay. The clothes don't look at all right to me. They look Elizabethan. No, they really the don't. The beard is, is a little pointy one. And that collar, that's an Elizabethan collar, isn't it? It's not one from now, from this era. I didn't think. I'm not an expert on clothes, but they didn't look right to me. No, the sleeves are wrong. The shoulder pieces are wrong. So the way... It, when we're still talking about Henry VII era... The clothing is very much still gowns, mm. and the sleeves and the top are more often than not together. They don't change out the same way the Elizabethan ones do later, mm. or even Henry VIII's. So the way he's got sort of a, a, almost a vest over top of an undershirt doesn't seem quite right. No, I didn't think any of, the, any and, of it feels, felt right to me. no. And it's got a ruff around the neck, yeah. which, again, was not at all during Henry VII's no. period. Henry VII's period, we're still looking at more of a medieval look. I mean, it might have been a later rendition of how people thought he might have looked. But that yeah. was the only picture I could find. The other picture I've got is of his... his Coat of arms? Which is quite a nice one. I like it. I quite yes, like it is. It with, with the shape of the helmet, which is that sort of frog's mouth one. Yes. That was for squires and gentlemen which is too low for the rank of Lincoln. But apparently really? at this time, the rules hadn't been set in stone. Later on, you could tell from the from the shape of the helmet where they stood in, in rank. But at this time, okay. it wasn't, you know, it was a bit hit and miss. So his coat of arms, I'm just going to see if I can explain it, which might be a little difficult. It looks like a head of Zeus is at the top. It's it's very Greek looking. Mm, red. It Yeah, it's bright red with a golden circlet. 
over top of, I don't even know what those are. They look kind of like scrolled leaves. They are, it's called a wreath. It's a, it's a, it's a common trait in, in coats of arms. They usually had a wreath at the top of their helmet that the thing sat okay. on. And, and that one's red and white. Yeah, and sitting, why is the head sitting on top of the helmet? There's always something on top of the helmet. Oh, mm. okay. Yeah, if you look at other ones, you get eagles and lions. There's a sheaf of corn on one of them. And they're fairly ridiculous looking, aren't they? And we saw yeah, on, um, yeah. who was it? Was it John DeVere? Yeah, John DeVere's jousting helmet. With the boar. And, and, a, and half a brick. Like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thought it was it's... quite interesting. I quite, I'm, I'd quite like to learn more about heraldry. But that is yeah. all we've got. And the shield that the helmet is sitting on, and that would be the escutcheon, is the quartering of the shield. With the lion rampant. And six heads of some other big cat. Yes. But I'm afraid yeah. I'm going to have to give him nothing, I think, because one of the pictures yeah. probably isn't him. And that's yeah. all I could find. Sorry, but that's a zero for me, too. Is that, I think that might be the first. Is it the first zero? Yes. That is the first zero. Mm. We gave somebody else a one because they had an action figure. <laughs> Well, he maybe he had an action figure. I, d I didn't think to look for action figures this time. But we can't rely on action figures all the time. <laughs> no, we cannot. We're meant to be a, a respectable historical podcast. <laughs> We're meant to be. <laughs> uh, 27, 31 for me and 30 for you. Yes. Oh, hang on. Oh, I was about to say, oh, hang on. I haven't um, done the flaunt to flaunt, but half of zero is zero. So, yes, it's 61. 61. Mm. That's what I've got as well. Anyway, what do we think? Are they too delicious or what? I'm sorry, but no, we don't have enough detail. It was a bit of a damp squib in the end. Yeah, I had such high hopes for him too. Yes, I mean, there was no book about him that I found. Somebody else will probably pop up and say, oh, didn't you see the 12-volume book? <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't find any specific book about him, which was the first, first time I've had that. Okay. I mean, I've, I found lot, lots about him in different books, but generally it was the same thing. So I've got a feeling oh. that we've got everything here. <laughs> yes. And that nobody's found anything else. So, yeah. It just seems odd that since he was quite high up yeah. in Richard's reign, I mean, he couldn't have been much higher. And he became pivotal or pivotal in a rebellion. Mm. You would think somebody would have focused on him. Mm. But the documentation doesn't appear to be there. Yeah. So no, I was, I was a bit there. Yeah. I was quite quick. It's about the quickest, quickest research I've done, <laughs> <laughs> which was nice after Perkin. <sighs> no. No, no, for you no, as well. It just didn't do it for me. Uh, sorry, John de la Pole. I actually thought he was going to be way more exciting. I'm not sure. It, I mean, he rushed across the sea, he set up an army, he raced mm -hmm. across to Ireland, they crowned a small boy, then they raced across to yep. Lancashire and marched across Yorkshire hoping to pick people up, but didn't. And then they died yeah. horribly in a battle. I mean, it is exciting. <laughs> it is, just not enough detail, I guess, is you, what you I You really mean. need the detail for, for a story. And we were lack yes. lacking a story, I felt. And I like a story. Yeah, me too. Mm, no. Well... Wow. Shall we pull your next one? Yes. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Pull up my box. Rifle around in there. Let's see what we got. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I always grab a pen as if I'm to write it down as if I'm going to forget. <laughs> Philip the Fair, the Duke of Burgundy and King of Castile. Ah, that's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, and I found books on him when I was searching, researching Isabella. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of material on him. No, that was going okay. to be a good one. Yeah. I'm afraid to say that now because I thought John de la Pole was going to be so good. <laughs> I'm afraid that both the de la Poles have let us down somewhat, haven't they? Yes, they have. <laughs> And we've got another one to come. 
We've got Edmund. Yes. And I think he will... I'm, I'm going to chink and sit now. I think he will be interesting. <laughs> he has more interactions with various people that we know of already. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid to say he's going to be interesting too. <laughs> he was in uh, The Winter King a lot, wasn't he? Yes. So anyway, anyway, I've got him. I've got Philip the Fair. Which, <laughs> so I'm sure that would be great. That is the end of our episode on John de la Pole, the first Earl of Lincoln. We hope you've enjoyed it and will join us for the next episode on... Polydor Virgil. Polydor Virgil. I know, I'm sitting here going, I can't believe I have to do Polydor <laughs> Virgil. <laughs> I'm sure he's lovely. <laughs> oh, his books just arrived. The Anglia Historia. I can't get, but I got the rest of them. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Oh, I just say actually that we had intended to do a new Facebook tune. I thought after twenty episodes we'd do a new Facebook tune, and we were going to do it between Christmas and New Year. Yes, but we went down with a lurgy and were asleep for all that time, so we never got to do it. <laughs> so we haven't done one yet. You can find <laughs> details of the podcast and contact us on. In the meantime, smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel. Bring oil to fire, snow to their colder moods. Goose, if I had you upon Sarum Plain, I'd drive ye cackling home to Camelot. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Yes. Mm-hmm.